Welcome to Launch Code, a premier business podcast, starring Evan Haver, Matt Best, and Jared Taylor. All right, welcome back to the Launch Code with uh, Matt, Hello. Evan, and Jamie Caldwell. So today we're going to talk about uh, transitioning and then post. I not the transition that you're thinking of. It's hard now because yeah. it's 2018. There's, it's, there's a lot of other transitioning happening. You know, and everything's acceptable now. To Everything. each your own, you know, but um, not in this room today. Nope. Uh, so Jamie, what is it that you do for a profession? I professionally fish. Shit, man. Bass fish and saltwater fish, too. Right. Oh, yeah. So primarily? Primarily bass. Okay. And freshwater. Salt, freshwater. Mm -hmm. Nice. Do you have your own bass boat? I do. I'm super jealous. Big old boat with a jacked up truck all wrapped in multicam. Really? Rolling down the highway. Oh, yeah. Get yeah. some good looks. Is with there, a, uh, how, how big is your boat? Like, was that like a 12 footer? 20. 20? 20, 20, wow. 20 feet. Yeah. And it has one. a uh, 250 horsepower outboard. So it. It scoots along at a pretty good pace. It's about an 80 mile an hour boat. Whoa. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's a fast boat. Do you have a troll motor as well? I do. Nice. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's it's hooked up with everything. I mean, it's top of the line. It's multiple graphs on there for finding fish electronically. When, yeah. when did you ETS? When did you get out? I got out. I retired in December of 14. Okay. So yep. it's been a few years. Was this something that you're doing while you were in the military, or is it like I got out of the military and you're like, okay, I'm gonna go be a fisherman? No, I, I've done it my whole life. I mean, I right. um, I always loved to fish. I grew up fishing. I, I grew up in Connecticut and uh, mostly fly fish for trout. You know, tie my own flies. I, every every weekend I was going somewhere, pedaling my bike and going to hit a pond or, or a creek. Uh, when I joined the military, my first assignment was at First Ranger Battalion, and that's where I picked up bass fishing. Okay. I ended up linking up with uh, a local guy, and you know we were going fishing all the time. He saw just how enthusiastic I was about it, and he says, "You need to join a bass club." I mean, this was mid '90s. I'm like, well, "What's a bass club?" So uh, he got me into a bass club, and it's basically, I mean, a group of guys like a bowling league or you know anything right. else. We get together okay, way once cooler a than a bowling league. <laughs> yeah. <Way cooler. laughs> Nothing against it's, bowling, but no. catching fish with your friends seems a lot more. It's enjoyable. definitely, but there's a lot of. Well, there's a lot of alcohol involved in bowling. But what what do you do, man? When you when you, when you join that, like, w what does that look like? I I'm from the Northwest. Like, there's not that I know of in Idaho. There's there's nothing like that that I know of. So yeah, tell it, me what that. Looks I like. mean, it's throughout the entire country now. Bass fishing is, is huge. Uh, okay. It's absolutely huge. Um, but w when you join a club, you're you have a meeting like once a month, and right. you have a tournament once a month. Okay. So it's a bunch of guys that get together with their boats. And you go out and you spend eight hours out there trying to catch the best five fish. You come in at the end of the day, and it's according to weight. You know your total five fish. Total total, total. weight, not yep. individual. But yep. is there they separate do, prizes? They do. They do. There's a separate pot uh, for big fish. Okay. So they'll do a separate pot for big fish, and that's total and, weight. If I'm correct, right? You once you pick a fish, uh, you can't release that after it for a larger fish. Once you pick it, that's that's one fish, correct? Or can you? It, that does happen. Um, generally, generally it's not. Generally, you, what we called culling. So you go out there, and I may catch. Let's say I catch five fish, my limit in the first thirty minutes. Well, then my sixth fish I catch. If it's bigger than one of my others, I take the smallest one, I throw it back. So you continue okay, you to can. upgrade. Okay. Yep. You upgrade throughout the day. Now there, there are some crazy. I, I think they may have fixed it. There was some crazy laws in um, Michigan or Wisconsin or something where you couldn't call. You could not release a fish that you caught, you know. There, once you once you caught it, you had you had to keep it. Um, and it, some of the tournaments, it, it played in there, so it you, it just varies on where you're at. But primarily, five fish, and you just call all day. How long have you been professionally fishing now? Probably eight years. Oh shit! Really? Yeah. Really? So I, I I was doing it while I was yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I um I started fishing in Savannah. Started doing tournaments. You know. Like everybody, military ranger, you know, special ops stuff, adrenaline junkie. So I love fishing. I go out there in my first tournament, and you're racing boats because you got to race to the spot. You know, beat everybody else. You're racing around the lake all day. You know, you're fishing, which I love, and then you got money involved. You're competing for money. I'm like, this is it. I love this. <laughs> you know. Uh, and then I figured out that you could get paid to do it, right. get sponsors to pay for everything. And you know, I mean, some of the tournaments I fish, there's a hundred thousand, over a hundred thousand dollars for first place. Really? So there's oh yeah, there's good money involved. Really good money. 
how do you even become a professional fisher? Is there like a, you, have, you have to do amateur first? You have to rank in a tournament and then get a license? Or kind of. I mean, there, there's no pro card, and um, it's it's moving up through the ranks. You know, you start kind of at the club level, and then you go to the BFL or like the weekend level. You know, a one day tournament on Saturday, and then you start moving up into multi day tournaments. You know, and then the the top level is your Bassmaster Elite Series and your FLW Tour. Uh, that's that's your top level and. You know, you have a mix of amateurs and pros in there. But it's, and where where are you at right now? Um, I'm fishing the Bassmaster Opens this year, the Eastern Opens, which is just below the Elite Series. That's how you qualify okay. to get to the Elite Series. Last year, I fished FLW Tour, which is the top tour on the FLW side. But this year, I've I've launched my training company, One Minute Out, and it's just it, the first tournament conflicted with Shot Show. Kind of need to be here, you know, to do some tactical business. So I had to pull out uh, from FLW Tour for this year. Okay. So how many tournaments have you fished in? Oh, hundreds, hundreds of tournaments. Yeah. I mean, I, usually there's one a week, one, one a month at least, okay. sometimes multiple a month. And it's various levels. Right. So you'll have, you know, you're at the professional tour level. There's, you know, depending on the tour, eight to 10 tournaments throughout the year. Mm -hmm. But then there's the lower level like NASCAR. Right. You know, you've got the cup or the chase and then you've got the level below and guys jump down and you know and race in the level below do the same thing in bass fishing so you even if you're fishing the top you're going to jump down and fish the next level below there's certain levels you can't go to that you know there's certain tournaments i can't fish because of you know being can't go sneak being into the, the club level. and just clean house yeah. real quick yeah, with yeah, your exactly. nice equipment yeah but... they don't they don't they don't take too kind to that when you show up and take their money and now, if they take your money, right. they're all about it. Nobody says anything. But as soon as you start taking their money, they're, no, oh, pros can't fish this. You, you know, get out of here. You can't fish. So how, how does this run? So are you, you're obviously paying an entry fee of some type, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And then what, what do those typically cost? Anywhere. The tournaments that I fish are anywhere from 1500 to the tour is, it breaks down to almost like 5000 a tournament. Wow. It's, yeah, okay. when you do the tour, you commit to right. the entire tour. So there's a deposit you have to pay up front, which is about seven grand, and then you have installment payments, which are right around five grand a piece. And then how make. many? How many of those? Um, it totals out to be almost thirty three thousand wow. for one, and then the other one is close to like fifty thousand. Yeah, it's it's what would pricey. Be the, yeah, is what are the total earnings across that whole tournament? Is it you know each. Each day there's a reward, or is it, and then the best at the end, or? It generally, it's the best at the end. So uh, you do a three day tournament, your weights carry into the next day, and they start cutting people because you'll start with 100 to 150 turn, uh, guys in the tournament. Mm -hmm. after, after two days, we cut to the top 50, and then uh, they'll cut after that day, they'll cut to the top 10 or top 12, depending on the trail. And how many times? How many times you land in the top ten now? Like, um, I, I quite. A, I mean, quite a few times. Yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, I've had. I mean, I've had some good years. Uh, the past couple years since I retired, believe it or not, you think, all right, I got more time to put towards fishing. It's going to really take off, but it's kind of, it's kind of slowed down a little bit for me. Um, you know, the success side of it. Right. But the sponsorship side of it's still growing. You know, I mean, you throw in social media now. Right. Uh, into the mix, and that's. Uh, Sponsors are really, really looking at all the social media. Right. You know, you got to have strong numbers. You got to be putting in a lot of time into that aspect of it. And they're, I mean, I've had sponsors say, which, which seems crazy. You know, in in bass fishing, you think, yeah, if you're out there and you're winning and you're doing well, you know, they're all about it. But some of them, when you win a tournament, they're like, hey, hey great. I mean, it's, it's a bonus. You're gonna get some exposure, but it's a it's maybe a week you maybe have five days even winning at the very top level you've got about five days to capitalize on that via social media you know and you'll get people calling you and doing articles and it'll trickle out you know over the next couple months in magazines and and video type stuff but there's a new winner every weekend you know between the the pro and kind of the you know the level right below it there's there's so many tournaments going on that you know it's old news come the next weekend because there's another tournament. Right. It, I'm curious, like, how much is reliant on, like, being a technical fisher and then obviously the technology involved in fishing now? Because, you know, when I grew up, it was like, all right, there's a little shaded. It looks like got a branch in the ground. It's probably a good spot for a bass. But now, I mean, with fish finders and all the sonar capabilities, is is that really helpful 
but does is it kind of an equal playing field because most professional fishers have those assets and then it's more reliant on you as you know good intuition and all of that it, it it's a little bit of both i mean the 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 electronic stuff has definitely helped uh and that's i mean that's one of my big things i'm 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 all into the electronics i mean i've got the top line of everything and um you know you can you can really find fish faster now but you can Getting find them, them bite <laughs> exactly you yeah. can find them all day long but you still have to make them eat and that's where you know it, it comes into a lot of knowledge um you know trial and error and just history of of getting them to eat i mean for like the average person i mean it, it's, it's amazing how much even like lures come in as far as is it sunny outside is it cold what are the weather conditions what is what the There's season a science to it, science right? yeah it and i don't know anything about it. i just know like the generalities of it but right yeah i mean it, it, all those things play you know they play on on what you're gonna do because you could go out one day during practice and you know it's overcast all day long the fish are roaming so when it's overcast they have no reason to hold tight to any type of cover they're roaming around and they're swimming around and, and eating on the move well then the sun pops out and it's super bright and sunny now they're looking for some shade they're going to those shady spots they're looking for a little bit of cover um water conditions vary you know if it's really clear then they're not going to be roaming that much they'll sit in some ambush places but they can see better so they'll feed off a of sight then when you go into the dirty stained water now it it's almost like and use the analogy if you were in a room even if it was your own home and you totally black the lights out like you cannot see anything pitch dark black you're not you're still not going to walk around that house like i hit my shit the on lights. the bed like a crazy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, shit. right so what you do is you you edge your way around the walls or around furniture you kind of feel your way around bass are doing the same thing hmm. when when it gets real stained you know the water gets muddy or they're in that section they'll hold tighter to that cover so it's a little easier to target them and find them because you have things to target and look there should be a fish there that's a big stump or a lay down it and then are they there. are they eating and biting on like vibrations and smell or is that they use all their senses so vibration is a is a key part of it you know they have if you look at a largemouth bass or pitcher they have this kind of black line that goes down their side that's their lateral line that's how they sense movement and and everything in the water they can hear and they can smell and they can see but a lot of times they're 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 picking up that vibration in the water and movement of a bait and then they'll they'll come in and close in on it and then as they get closer depending on water conditions that's when they'll see it and eat off a of site or you know they may smell something and it just triggers a bite you know or bass are bass are very aggressive I mean, if uh, they're kind of like a holes, you know. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, I, yeah. If if they got any bigger than they did, I would not swim in freshwater. I mean, they're like freshwater sharks, just really? for no reason at all. I mean, they'll eat, and that's right. that's part of what you have to do out there tournament fishing because there's small windows where they feed. Right. But you have to trigger them to eat throughout the day to be successful. So you've got to do something. It's usually to, like morning and dusk, right? Yeah. Generally, generally morning and dusk is the best feed times. But So are you going after them in different ways just based off of the time of the day? Like yep. okay, 1 p.m. is going to be significantly different than 7 a.m.? Con yeah, conditions will change throughout the day, and you have to adjust to it. And the, the guys that can adjust faster, quicker, and can see those, those conditions changing and react to them faster, those are the guys that are more successful. I don't know why I'm so intrigued by this. No, I no, love this ice. is super interesting. I, I, I I've up, never met. I've never met a professional no. fisherman ever. So, like, you're the first one. Obviously, I've met a poor, but really? uh, this is super interesting. I mean, that like strategy has got to be hugely important to winning, placing. I mean, all of those things. So, what are you doing in preparation? I mean, besides fishing, are you? What are you doing, man? Yeah, are you researching like, like what, historical what, trends? What's, of the yeah, what's going on? Not, my military, my military background has helped me. Right Quite now, in operation. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we use satellite imagery a ton. Oh, you know, right. you, you get handed a target. Hey, here's, you know, we're going after this guy, looking at pattern of life, or, you know, hey, here's his bed down location. Boom. Intel guys are pulling up imagery right away. You've got, I mean, up to one meter satellite imagery you're looking at. And, you know, you're, you're putting together your plan. All right. How am I going to attack this target? Where's the best way to come in? The whole nine. I've taken that concept and turned it to bass fishing. So I use multiple. Um, satellite imagery, you know, shots from different websites, from different organizations. I've even paid to get some better high quality um, imagery. And, you know, maybe I've, while I was still in, I might have had some friends in Intel that you know, kind of <laughs> hooked me up with some really good imagery. Uh, there um, might be a lake. I need you to pull up a nice yeah. GRG for me. Hence. <laughs> Why he was doing better on active yeah, duty? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I had. I had Is a it called more help. GRG? It's a LRG, like a lake <laughs> reference guide. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it. Wait a second. Though. 
but it's uh, i mean believe it or not one of my tournaments we were we were deployed and um i was doing a bunch of research for it looking at imagery i came back and had my tournament within a week i mean i got like one practice day and i won the tournament it was, it was all off of like all the research I did while I was in Iraq, you know, map studies, looking at satellite imagery. I, I ended up via satellite imagery. I found a hump that was showing on the imagery. You could see it through the clear water like, yeah, there's some high ground right there. And it was not on any map. Hmm. I went out there during, you know, practice, checked it out, found it. I'm like, yeah, it's pretty good. Hey, there's some fish here. And I mean, there was a it was a great school of fish on it. And I mean, it lasted three days. You know, and just go out there and hammer them. So on a practice day, are you just doing essentially like recon and scout? Or are you actually fishing to see? But you don't want the fish to bite prior to the tournament, I'd imagine. Right. It's depending on how far out you're allowed to practice. Some of the tournaments, you know, you can't be on the water up until like official practice. So we get three days of official practice. On the start of it, I'll go out and I'll, I'll catch fish. Um, and sometimes into day two, I'll catch them. You know, especially if you're getting bit quite a bit in an area, you want to check and see, well, what's the quality of these fish? Am I wasting time with a bunch of one pound fish that really aren't going to help me in this tournament? I need to check and see, all right, you know, are these good quality fish that, yeah, I'm, you know, I want to catch these fish in the tournament. So it, it depends. I mean, like everything with fishing, you have to look at what you've got. What's the conditions, you know, how close are you to actual tournament day? Because, most likely, any any fish you catch in practice, especially the day, maybe two days before a tournament, you're probably not going to catch that fish in the tournament. Right. And what's what's a good like when you catch a fish, like what what do you? When keep am it? I jumping up what and do you, down and yeah, doing the big old yeah, happy yeah, dance? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it, if I'm you know if you're up north, then you don't necessarily need those bigger fish because they don't grow that big. Mm-hmm. Down south, yeah. I mean, you catch eight ten pound bass, you're <laughs> I mean, you're, the, you're doing the happy dance. Holy crap. What's yeah. the largest bat? In the largemouth, right? Or? Yes, lar- yep, largemouth. We we do, in the tournaments, you're allowed largemouth, spotted bass, smallmouth. And then there's a few other species in, in certain areas, like Guadalupe bass. Um, there's, a, there's a different breed of spotted bass. But, you know, generally all those count. And largemouth, though, usually get the largest. And my biggest fish, believe it or not, comes from North Carolina. Uh, right, right near my house, uh, a lake that is made is recently made the top number four on the top 100, you know, bass lakes that was published, but it was just over 10 pounds, 10.02. Wow. It was in a tournament, Ooh. and I, I caught that fish early in the morning. It was you know 7:30 in the morning, first spot I pull up one. I caught that fish. I put it in the boat, and I throw right back out there, same bait, same place, and catch one just over eight pounds. Oh, <laughs> yeah! I sat down, had a sandwich. You, know, I'm like, oh. you got a Moab, yeah, a mother like, of all bass, man. Oh yeah! I was like, so I got almost 20 pounds, and we're 30 minutes into the tournament. Like, head back time to the for ramp, a nice probably. sandwich and <laughs> yeah. a nap. Go take a nap. <laughs> yeah. What, so what? What's what weights are winning? Like what is a good um, like like collectively? You know what I mean? It averages between anywhere from 15 to 20 pounds. You know, there okay. there are some lakes. Wow, where, really? Oh yeah, there's some lakes that it's going to take 30 pounds. And this is a five. You know, we're yeah. talking about five fish, five fish stream. Right. But there's, I mean, there's quite a few tournaments that it's in the 30 pound range. Got it. Um, you know, for one day. So you catch a 10 pound bass, you're. I mean, oh yeah, you got a big head start. Yeah, that's you your what we huge, call that's your kicker. Got it. You know, yeah, because that, you're looking at your average weight fish. of yeah, you can you five can pretty much per bass, right? Yeah, yeah you can expensive. pretty much just like like I guess yeah, you, you sit down and have a sandwich. Yeah, at that oh, yeah. point. Since you, you get two of them, you just that's, that's eight four to ten fish total probably. That's when, that's when I can that. sit down and start grinding my coffee. Yeah, whip out the hand grinder, not drinking the K cup. Let's make this right. That's incredible, man. Like like so. Hundreds of tournaments, like you know, from the guy that's like, "Hey, I'm I'm a weekend bass fisherman. Like, I'm not. I'm never want to be pro, but I'm a weekend guy. That like, let's w- give us some pro tips, a little bro. advice. Yeah, give us some pro tips. Uh, get out there as much as you can. Okay. Yeah, I mean that's you. You can't replace. There's so much information on the internet. It, it's yeah. great. You can. You know, you can find so much out there and you can learn a lot. If you're not on the water, then be researching. Get on the internet. Just Google stuff. Go to YouTube and watch videos. Um, you'll learn a lot. But for me, maybe other people are different. I've got to do it. I'm a hands-on type of person. Mm-hmm. So I can read it, see it, you know, do it all day long uh, on the computer. But I have to be out there. When I'm on the water and I apply those and then I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I just caught fish doing this. That's when it sticks. Um, but getting out there on the water as much as you can, that's where you're really going to learn your lessons. That's where you're going to see those conditions change and go, oh, okay, yeah, the sun just went in, and you know, now I just caught him on this bait versus that bait. Or you know, you may change color when the sun goes in from something that's real clear 
to maybe something that's a little bit more white. Mm -hmm. It just helps the bass see it better. Got it. You can learn a lot of that on the internet, but getting out there and applying it. So get out there, you know, absolutely as much as you can. Um, and if it's if this you're is a more specific question, but you said you are switching to white to see it better. Why wouldn't you use that bait during like very clear water? Is it will you spook a bass because they can actually see that it's not moving correctly like an actual fish? Or you can in in real the deal with real clear water that you want to watch out for is you never want the fish to get a, a really good look at your bait. Because hmm. then they can tell, uh, something's not right, something's right. off. So staying with baits that are moving a lot faster, more erratic, and more translucent. So they see it, you know, that there's there's something there, and they come in to investigate it. And then with the erratic movement, you can just trigger that, you know, that feed response. Yeah, it's kind of like when you're like a girl's on a four on the hot scale, and she goes to a super dark club. Like the the, the guidos are going to feed on them because they can't yeah. see the bait that well. And yeah, they wake up in it. the morning, they're in the boat, and they're like... Oh man, oh, man. I just got fished. I just got <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so my, my next question is, it's uh, one minute out. So you're a busy man. Like you, you've got a lot going on between fishing and one minute out. Tell us a little bit about that. So one minute out started uh, about a year ago. Just it started through fishing. A buddy and I that I fish with, who's a um, Chris Murphy. He's a uh, SWAT, you know, law enforcement guy to Arlington. So he's pretty busy. Um, we saw a, a fishing company out there called five by three and all they were was a logo and it's a five with the, you know, multiplication sign that has hooks on it and a three and it, it means five fish by three o'clock. So oh, you know, the tournament nice. anglers like five by Got three. It. Yes, I get it. That's awesome. Right. You know, and it took off and that's all it was, was a logo. They was, it was t-shirts and hats. And then all of a sudden they were doing sunglasses. The guy ended up selling the company for like a couple million dollars you know, a few years after he started it. And it was like, quick, bam, done. So we're like, we need to have something like that. Why, why don't we? So we started, you know, looking at, hey, what can we do on the tactical side that could maybe apply for tactical, for fishing? And we came up with, you know, one minute out. And it's, you know, when you're when you're going in on the military side, tactical side, when you're going in on target, you know, you're in a helo, you're flying around, just like everybody, you know, we're smoking and joking two, three minutes out, you know, just laughing and having a good time. You hit that one minute call, you know, one minute, and that's that's when you change. You know, that's when you flip the switch. You're firing at 100%. You know, you're, all your sensors are firing. You're just dialed in. You're ready to go. So trying to tell that story of live like you're one minute out. You know, so live like that all the time. You know, the more that you see the logo on things, it's it kind of clicks. And, and just try to be like that all the time. Try to be at your best, you know, focused and firing at 100%. And what, what do you guys what do you guys sell? We're uh, right now just some you know t-shirts, hats, mm -hmm. um, getting getting some other stuff in. But our focus right now is is training. Um, you know, I, I kind of took a break, did a lot of fishing when I retired. You know, I sort of needed it. Um, Fourteen, well, I mean, twenty-one years. Right. I got when I finished my time at First Ranger Battalion. Uh, you know, I went to Fort Bragg to a Special Operations Unit up there. Spent fourteen years there. Did fourteen deployments between Afghanistan, Iraq, Bosnia, you know, some other places. And in pretty much the entire time I was there, I was going hard and heavy. You know, so when I retired, I, I needed a break. You know, just I, I was done with it. I didn't want to have anything to do with anything tactical. You know, just want to kind of walk away. Fishing was my therapy. You know, I get on the water, everything just, just kind of goes away. Uh, but now it's been a couple years, and, and I, as much as I learned, you know, over those 14 deployments, I saw... I saw us change so much from like the Somalia mindset and carrying everything and having all kinds of stuff on your kit to, you know, early Afghanistan, the different stuff that we did. You know, I mean, hunted bin Laden, you know, up in Tora Bora, um, you know, actually hearing his voice on a radio. I mean, we were, you know, so close. And then seeing Iraq kick off and us, you know, hard and heavy in Baghdad and then start to push out and running out stations. Just our kit changed. The way we did business changed a lot. You know, and then I, we, we used to go, you know, which we, we kind of guys still do. Um, but, you know, a lot of going hard. Blow doors, you know, using explosive breaching, going in, CQB, white light, just fast and furious, surprise speed and violence of action. And we saw the it kind of taper into the call out piece, you know, where guys, they were expecting you when you came in. So blowing doors and running in to a machine gun nest, you know, wasn't necessarily the smartest thing. So you had to sort of back up and, and slow down on some targets. And, um, I, I just, I saw a lot of change. So now I look at it 
and doing some work. I consult for Core Survival, which we do helmet strobes. You know, we do a bunch of IR stuff, and we've got a bunch of them in military units, SF, you know, Rangers running them, and, and meeting all these different guys and talking to them and hearing where there's there's gaps in training. You know, I'm like, with all the experience I have, I, I just I feel like I need to share it. You know, I need to be out there and, and teach the lessons learned, you know, especially on the LE side. We get a lot of those guys that are coming. They're finally able to buy night vision. They're looking at our lights. You know, we need an IR strobe for the helmet. But they're like, we have no idea how to use this stuff. We This is first time getting NVGs. They don't even have lasers yet. You know, nobody prior military on their teams. And they're just kind of lost. So I'm like, well, that, that's my focus. My focus right now is NVG training. So um, I'm doing my first course is in Tucson, Arizona in March. And it's a basically an MVG operator course, two day course. I'm gonna put them through some classroom stuff, just get them familiar with their equipment, make sure their gear is set up right. Then we're gonna go out on the range, you know, do some day shooting, uh, get them zeroed, make sure they're they're zeroed with all their day sights, and then roll right into the night stuff. Get them get them zeroed at night, show them how to zero their lasers, get everything dialed in, do a bunch of different shooting drills, uh, do some different drills and different things with under nods for them to get used to moving around, depth perception. And then, um, you know, roll into a little bit of force on force and, you know, a little bit of CQB type stuff with them. And every class will vary. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's taken off. I mean, one, once I've kind of announced that and right. start putting it out there, I could be probably doing something every single week wow. somewhere. Yeah. Wow. It's, the requests okay. are, are just rolling in. So wow. it's, it's, it's going good. It's going real good. And are you partnered with anybody on that or just you? Yeah, I'm, I'm partnered with Chris uh, okay. Murphy. Yep. Yeah, we're, we're partnered up and, you know, we're going to run some. Okay, he's still in. He's still, oh. you know, doing the LE piece. He stays right. pretty busy. And we've got that, you know, geographical separation. I'm still in North Carolina. He's in, he's in Virginia. Uh, but we're looking to come together for some courses near us. Uh, I'm doing some stuff with another company that's been doing some night vision training, uh, more just kind of straight law enforcement piece, but he brings in that certification. You know, law enforcement's huge on, you know, yeah, we're certified on this. We went to this course and he's tied in with NTOA, which oh, is nice. the yeah, National yeah. Tacticals Officers Association. Yeah. So we're going to be able to, you know, here you go. You went through our course, you're certified, you know, X amount of hours on MVGs and you've done this, this, and this. So it's, I mean, I'm willing to work with, you know, whoever, just get out there, get some training, you know, good training out there on the street and really help these guys out. So, you know, they're not, they're not lost out there on target and they can use this technology. So it's primarily LEO that you're doing mostly. Yeah. I've got, um, I've got some government agencies that have contacted me that want to set up some classes and, uh, I mean, it's open to military too. So it's just get, getting the word out there, you know, mm -hmm. for those guys that, that want to do something. And what do you got this year? Like, what do you got scheduled as far as like tournaments you're fishing in, and then courses that you've a little you've bit left? of everything. Like yeah. you said, I'm 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 busy. Um, so doing the tournament stuff right mm -hmm. now. I'm I'm signed up for one pro trail. I've got uh, five five events for for that trail, and then there's you know some other tournaments mixed in there. Some team tournament stuff that I'm going to do you know closer to home, and then the training side. Um, I mean, right now there's about three or four courses on the books and you know, just right now trying to schedule, schedule more, schedule the rest and, and find the dates and the gaps in, in there to, to get them done. Is there good bass fishing in Texas? There's phenomenal bass fishing in Texas. Well, then we would like an yeah. email when you're in town yeah. and oh, yes. uh, we will come join. Yeah, yeah we're, definitely. so we're moving the company down to San Antonio. So you're going to have oh. to come down and go bass fishing with us i actually what i meant to say was you're gonna have to come down and teach us how to go bass fishing yes. that, go. that's what i mean yeah uh Deal. i'm a fly fisherman so i, I fish for trout I'm, yeah oh, that'd be awesome yeah texas you guys are in the mecca of it i mean okay good yeah you can fish all year great fishing too huge i mean there's some huge bass down there they i mean they grow them <laughs> like Texas, everything's big everything's in everything's big in texas. Big even the bass. Texas. Yeah, even the bass yeah you you will love that It'll be good. Well, this is phenomenal, man. Thanks for stopping by. We're uh, we're in, we're out. This was fucking great. Uh, next year, we'll get an update on where you've been, what you're doing. Uh, where can people find yes. you? Um, all social media. One minute mm -hmm. out. 
Okay. Uh, Instagram primarily uh, for that. We're you know growing some other stuff, but that or just you know Jamie Caldwell. All my social media stuff: Instagram, Twitter, nice. uh, YouTube channel. So um, if people are interested as well into participating in one of your courses, where would they go directly for that? A best bet is either uh, one minute out at gmail.com or just go to Instagram and, and just message me via Instagram right now. So okay. So we get the website up and running and, and all that. Perfect. Awesome. Great. Thanks, man. Th yeah, thank you, thank so you much. guys. Fuck I, yeah. I appreciate it. This is awesome. Great.